Are VERS and VSAFE broken down to track reported events by state? Great. And we have our VERS coordinator, uh, Pauliana Stewart. She's the Deputy Immunization Program Manager. Uh, she's on with us today, as is Matt Bobo. And, and maybe this is a good segue, and we can really kind of spend some time talking about VERS and the VERS reports and um, uh, kind of go into that in a little bit of detail. So, Pollyanna, could you just tell us a little bit about VERS and how the reports come in and what the, what the objectives of VERS are? So we have uh, two different systems, the vSafe, which is the new system that CDC is using that's more active. So it's a texting system where you can choose to have them text you um, between your vaccines and they'll also let you know if, um, you know, ask you if you're having any uh, reactions. VAERS is a system that we've had for many, many years and it's for all vaccines and it's accessible to the whole population to pull data from. Um, the system itself is a passive system, so they, the data in there is, they only look at it when they think that it needs further investigation. So anyone can put into that system, anybody from the public, uh, doctors, uh, anyone at all. So the VAERS, uh, even though it shows all the data of all the reactions, it's not confirmed reactions. It's uh, just people actually saying what they had. And we do encourage everyone in Alaska to put whatever, even if they don't think it's uh, a part of the uh, reaction to the vaccine. If it happened, they, as far as virus is concerned, there is no time period. So if someone gets a vaccine, dies two months later, or has a reaction two months later, they want everyone to put that information in so it can be looked at. I think that's a great. And, and Pollyanna, maybe you can just speak a little bit to deaths, um, people who have been vaccinated. We know that people are dying every day for a wide variety of reasons. And just, you know, by chance alone, you're going to have people who are vaccinated yesterday who died today because they had underlying medical conditions, things like that. But all that gets reported into theirs. Can you just speak a little bit to um, how deaths in particular are followed up? Um, by CDC and state health departments, um, deaths that are reported into theirs. Uh, so the CDC does want all deaths regardless of when they happen after vaccine reported. What they do from there is they will ask the hospital or the medical center for medical records. They'll review them and if they think that there's further investigation needed, they'll. Um, there's another program called the CDC ISA, which is a Clinical Immunization Safety Assessment Project. Um, they will actually investigate along with v the FDA, CDC, um, in immunologists. They get a whole bunch of doctors together and have a call to go through the, all the information within that um, uh, record to see if there is something that brings it back to the vaccine. Um, also, practitioners, if you have a person that you want them to investigate, you can actually go to the website right there on the CDC website. Just put CISA and CDC and Google and it'll bring it up. And you can actually request for them to look at a specific person as well. So far, Alaska's had um, ones that are reported after having the vaccine, but none of them have been um, brought back to the vaccine as the cause. I didn't like it. Okay. As soon as we find some something like that, we'll let everyone know. Great. Thank you, Pollyanna. And Matt Bobo, anything you would add to that? Um, nothing to add. I would just encourage people to go to the website um, and to look up Be Safe. Um, in terms of pamphlets and flyers, we are printing them and they're um, sending them to providers to help spread the information about VAERS and Be Safe. So I think that the real take home message, and maybe I'll let Dr. Olson speak to this as well, but the real take home message is with respect to theirs, as Pollyanna um, mentioned, it's a passive system and CDC wants any, any potential reaction, anything that happened shortly after a vaccine was administered to be reported into theirs. And so they just, uh, they want more information than less. And even if the clinician doesn't think it's linked at all to the vaccine, they say, please just put it in anyway. 
and we will our investigators will follow up as necessary especially with fatalities or severe adverse reactions um liz anything you would add to that you know i think it i think one of the conversations we had with cdc recently um really kind of illustrates how VARES works so you know we um we heard from somebody who uh works in a nursing home saying you know we have um folks who are getting these vaccines and we also work in a place where um, you know, unfortunately, many of our many of our residents are ill, and some do die. And so, if somebody dies after getting the vaccine, um, you know, what do you want us to do? Even if it's you know clearly not related to the vaccine. And so, we ask CDC, and CDC says, says, you know, we want you to report it anyway. And we asked them for how long after, and they said there isn't any limit to the time after. So they actually wanted us to report things that happen. Really, the answer we got was indefinitely after. So I think that sort of illustrates, you know, some of how things go into VAERS. Um, and, the, and the CDC really wants to know about, you know, everything so they can follow up on anything, even if there's a tiny chance it could be concerning. Yeah, and, you know, of course, they want clinicians to use clinical judgment as well. If, you know, certainly if somebody got vaccinated a year ago and died, you know, uh, of a heart attack, they're not going to want that probably reported in VAERS. But Liz's point is a good one. There's there's really no deadline on this, and they want clinicians to use the best judgment. Um, you know, I think another thing that would be good to just chat about a little bit is some of the um, concerns about severe uh, allergic reactions to the vaccine. And we know that um, there have been severe allergic reactions that have been reported. They're rare. But I wonder, Dr. Domain, if you could just say a few words to the public about severe adverse reactions, especially now to the uh, the two mRNA vaccines, the Moderna and the Pfizer vaccine. Well, like you said, Joe, uh, they are relatively rare. The Moderna vaccine reported out 2.5 per million. The Pfizer originally pointed out 11 per million, and that's been now lowered looking at more people it's lower down to five per million. So that's infrequent. Uh, one of the concerns is an, an allergic reaction to what we call polyethylene glycol, which is one of the lipids that are used in vaccines. Uh, and that is something that has been reported to cause severe allergic reactions, mainly for people that are doing what we call a bowel prep. You're using this to clear the intestine before colonoscopy. But then even with that, out of in a 15 year period, nationwide, there have been only 52 cases. So even that is unusual. So right now, that's one of the main concerns. So if someone's had a problem with polyethylene glycol, or if they've had reactions to other vaccines that contain a similar product called polysteric, um, those can cross-react. So we're, we're being cautious about giving people a vaccine that have had either of those issues. However, patients that haven't even haven't had any of those issues can still have aller reactions, allergic reactions. So some reactions uh, may be not related to an allergy antibody, but may be some type of direct stimulation to what's called a mast cell. So we're looking for what we refer to as a systemic event, and that would be someone having maybe hives or flushing and if that's all that occurs, there may not be much concern. However, if the, you, you branch off into another system, like having shortness of breath or abdominal symptoms uh, that are occurring in the immediate time frame, uh, then we're concerned about what's referred to as anaphylaxis. And in those cases, the ones that I've seen, most have been mild. There's only been one that was, that was significant enough to require a brief hospitalization but most are mild and respond quickly to therapy, but we don't want those patients to receive a second vaccine. So that, I think that's really the takeaway point. They are infrequent, but that's why we observe the patients after the vaccine. So those that we feel are at higher risk, we observe for 30 minutes. Generally speaking, we observe for 15. And the vast majority of any reaction that's gonna occur will occur in that immediate period of time the majority within 15 minutes and even more if in 30 minutes. But after 30 minutes, it's there's still some risk, but that risk is much lower. So observation's important. Reporting the event is important. 
But if there, you if a if you recognize what appears to be an allergic reaction, certainly if it goes beyond the skin, then therapy is warranted, and that patient should be treated. We usually use adrenaline or epinephrine. Uh, and uh, we call 911 and or activate whatever emergency process you have. Again, this is an uncommon situation, but it is something that does occur. And when it does occur, it needs to be, be, be taken care of. Thank you, Dr. I, I think it's I think it's important to really underscore what you said there. You know, any any case of anaphylaxis is considered to be a severe adverse reaction even if the anaphylaxis event is sort of mild in nature, the person is sort of maybe given an epi, uh, epinephrine injection and then they, they do fine within you know, an hour or two after the, the initial reaction, we would consider that to be a milder uh, severe allergic reaction, but it's still considered severe in that, in that larger umbrella. And when we talk about the Moderna vaccine as well as the Pfizer vaccine, where we're seeing anywhere from three to maybe six cases per million doses administered of severe adverse allergic reactions. Um, most of those severe adverse allergic reactions would probably fall into what you were describing as a milder case of anaphylaxis. Would you say that's fair to say? I think that is fair. We, uh, th there's two different criteria for measuring anaphylaxis. There's what call, what's called the Brighton collaboration, and that is determining whether or not there is an, an anaphylaxis or not. Uh, we grade anaphylaxis with what's called a Mueller grade system, um, and so it has four grades of severity. Uh, the fourth is someone that has lost their blood pressure, they've dropped their blood pressure, they maybe have lost consciousness, uh, and that's a severe event. Most of the reactions that we've seen, and we've seen a few here in Alaska, are grade two or three. So they're on the milder scale, but it's still anaphylaxis. Uh, it's also critical that these be reported to VAERS because VAERS is very interested in this situation because we are trying to understand why this is occurring. Like I said, it may or may not be related to the polyethylene glycol, but it, we wanna understand why this happens uh, so it can be recognized. And if we can identify which people are at greater risk, uh, we can maybe avoid that by suggesting maybe a different vaccine that may be available within the next few months. So uh, I agree that that would consider them severe. And sometimes they can actually have a delayed or what we call a biphasic event. They may have that milder event. They're treated. It's possible they could have a subsequent event uh, you know, a few hours later uh, again, those are uncommon, but we need to be aware that that can occur. It occurs more commonly in children, but at this point, we're not vaccinating children, but that'll be coming up hopefully in the next months. Dr. Main, thank you so much. That's just so helpful. I hope, um, I hope that answers people's questions about severe adverse reactions to the vaccine.